the the science shows that the loved ones, the um, family members have as much stress as those affected by the cancer diagnosis directly. So um, hats off for listening to this talk right now. I think that it's so incredibly important that the person with a cancer diagnosis be supported and that you can learn this set of skills and you know, really try to figure out how you can be the best possible support to your loved one. And, um, and so I'm offering this kind of plethora of ideas uh, in the hope that uh, this can really make a difference in your life. So I'm, um, I'm excited to give this talk. First of all, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I use the language family member or loved one or support person. I don't like the expression caregiver. To me, it sounds like care is going in one direction. I give care to you. When the truth is we're always within relationship and that care is actually going in both directions. Even if somebody is debilitated in bed, they still have this opportunity to share their heart, their, their spirit with, with those around them. So there is this kind of communication. So that's why I'm going to say family member throughout. Um, the other thing I say is it's a person with a cancer diagnosis. Um, I don't like the short form cancer survivor. It's, it's because we're a person first. We're not defined by our cancer diagnosis. And so I, I want to just kind of make sure that the language is consistent through, throughout there. Here's what I want to talk about. Some very practical things in terms of what you can do to be part of the team, to get the best possible care to help uh, with healing. And then I'm going to talk through some practical uh, body, mind, spirit type of um, implementation, but really mostly I want to, I want to encourage people to be open and authentic with their communication to model, um, you know, how to stay more, um, grounded, peaceful, you know, grateful to whatever degree. So your, how you bring your spirit into this relationship actually has an influence on the relationship for the person who has a cancer diagnosis. So I'm hoping you get some practical advice through this as well as, um, uh, you know, thinking about how you can make that work in your particular situation. Some take home messages from today's really the empowerment piece. You can be part of the team that gets the information that really makes a difference in terms of quality of care within and beyond the medical system. Um, life is ever changing and your role as the family member, the support person will probably continue to change with time. And so we want to be open to that flexibility of character. I really encourage people to be open and honest with your emotions. It's the, it's the best way to live a kind of an authentic life that allows the energy to flow through you and also sets the culture within the relationship so the person with a cancer diagnosis can reciprocate. So incredibly important on that side. And lastly, I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to take care of yourself. Uh, it, you shouldn't feel guilty about the kind of sense of self-care even in the midst of the most difficult stuff, when you take care of yourself, you're a better family member, better able to serve, better able to think, uh, make good decisions um, and facilitate healing. So that's foundational. We shouldn't, we don't need to be guilty in any way around that. So that's what I'm going to kind of encourage you uh, through this talk. One of the most important things I think in our life is actually to be clear about what our greatest values are how do we want to manifest and to be deliberate about this and not, you know, just let the, the winds of the world blow us this way and that and be pulled out of our core, out of our groundedness. So I like to be deliberate about thinking about it. So how do you want to be in this world? What's most important to you? What are your greatest values? And then you're thinking about your loved one who has that cancer diagnosis. How do you want to be in relationship with them? How, what kind of partner, friend, uh, you know, spouse do you want to be? Son, daughter, you know, it's, so you have this opportunity to remember because you'll be tired at times. You'll uh, feel flustered at times. Keep coming back to what's most important. Keep returning on home to that. And I, I like to do that as a ritual. So first thing in the morning, I do my meditation with my wife and set that kind of sense of mindful meditation. And at the end of that, put my hands up, kind of this position symbol of openness. And it comes out as kind of a secular prayer saying, let me be really helpful. Let me be kind to each person. Let me 
um, be considerate and compassionate and loving to each and every person that I run into. So I'm setting that intention first thing in the morning with the hope that then that manifests throughout the day. So being very clear about your greatest values. The second one is thinking about those high um, intensity situations or high stress situations, whether it's going in for a medical appointment, whether it's having that difficult conversation, whether it's dealing with another family member who's not acting in the most mature fashion, you know, going into those situations, having that moment of calm and peace and remembering what you want in the long term, what's most important. And you may say, my relationship with my loved one is the most important thing. And so your uh, actions and thoughts are dictated by that highest principle. And the lastly, and it's the hardest thing by far, is that sometimes we simply do feel stressed, overwhelmed, uh, angry, you know, just upset. And to remember to come home, to settle down that kind of stressed, irritable brain, coming back to the wise, compassionate brain, and coming home to doing what's right, using your wisdom uh, and compassion in, the, in those moments. So if you can, try to keep coming home, keep practicing the muscle of coming home to yourself. And on that, I do like to actually do that little exercise with you right now. So as you're listening to this, I really suggest you follow along in a way that feels good for you, but come off the back of the chair, come to the edge of the chair, nice, strong posture. So you have that kind of strong, dignified role. You're taking your seat, you're taking your, your life force. Bring your attention into your body. You're grounding your body. You're energizing your body through your consciousness. And then the nice, slow, smooth out breath. So it's a longer, slower, smoother out breath. You can take a slightly deeper in breath, but a longer, slower, smoother out breath at whatever rate is best for you. And now what you're doing is you're teaching your heart and your nervous system to be more relaxed. The, the smoother out breath gives you a relaxation response. And then that sends a sense of peace and calm up to your brain. So then you can actually think more clearly. Allow your heart to warm, sense of compassion. Think of your loved one. And just send them your love and your care. Really wish them well. Allow your heart to open. A sense of love, compassion. And then from this state, set an intention for yourself. Be clear about this. How is it that I want to be in relationship with my loved one? Set that loving feeling into the relationship using your wisdom, your intuition, your compassion. And let it be so, right? So then you let go, you come back to the sense of mindfulness of your body, the sense of connected with the earth, solid, strong, making good, strong, practical decisions. And then a kind of openness to the sky, sense of possibility, transformation, healing, and that your good human heart connects the two, earth below, practical earth, and capacity to heal above. You just kind of come into that space. You can practice that. So it's, a, it's a relaxation technique as well. I'll talk about, to that, about that later. Okay. So I think setting the intention. And then, you know, there are this idea of mirror neurons, right? When, when you're more peaceful and grounded, your loved ones will pick up on that and they actually get a relaxation response off you to whatever degree. And I'm not talking about being in Zen state. It's just like whatever degree you can go from kind of a higher stress level to a lower stress level, you're going to have a positive influence on those people around you. So be the change, be the kind of psychological rock for your loved ones. Okay. So what is your role as the, as the family member, as the loved one, as the support person? I have a few analogies here. One is paddling in a canoe. So you can think of your loved one up front there paddling 
And they may ask you to paddle along, or they may ask you to simply rest. They want to do their own paddling. Maybe there are, you know, currents and so on. Sometimes you have to jump in and, and do some hard paddling. You know, the, the river changes, your, your role will change. And I would say the first thing is that your loved one, the one with a cancer diagnosis, the one who kind of dictates how much paddling you do. You're there to serve in whatever way is best. Sometimes you do have to paddle hard or make that decision. Okay, so then the other analogy, the other couple analogies is, and I, I hate to kind of um, you know, show you the extremes, but you could be, for instance, the cheerleader. You're there to say, you know, you're doing great, honey. I love you a lot. You know, I'm supporting you no matter what. So you're just kind of cheering them on. And again, I'm not trying to be derogatory in terms of that role. That's maybe exactly what they need there. You might be uh, in a relationship where you guys see yourself as a we. It's an equal partnership that is going to make the decisions together. That's lovely as well. And sometimes, you know, if your loved one is really sick, sometimes you have to jump in and make those hard decisions and kind of captain the ship, right? And so it's spectrum and it's fluctuating. The roles change. And again, I think it's most important that there's a full conversation around what your role is. And the person with the cancer diagnosis really gets to say, this is how I want you to be, right? I really think it's their cancer diagnosis. Yes, you're a, you're a we, I can, I can understand that, but really it's their life. And uh, I think, I, I, just, I guess I believe more in autonomy in that situation. Okay. I'm going to take you through some um, cognitive reframing. I'm going to do this about five times during the presentation because sometimes the core beliefs that we hold actually um, inhibit that true connection and true support. And so I'm showing you a three column technique. You can see up top is the word situation, which is just the raw data. So for instance, I'm talking to you right now is just the raw data. And then we have distressing thoughts. In step one, if we be mindful of how we think, how we perceive the world and how that perception can cause us more unnecessary grief, we have to be mindful. We have to also be humble to think that you might not have it all correct. Take you through step through two, which is awareness inquiry. Um, you know, is this actually helpful or not? In what way is exaggerated? And then step three is what, what I would call you your best self or your wise and compassionate self. It's the self that you want to be engaging in terms of making decisions and so on. And the wise self, the wise grandmother self is able to acknowledge the difficulty of the situation. It's like with the compassion for, wow, this is a difficult time. There's a kind of sense of a bigger perspective, looking at the situation from a, a greater sense, and then also being encouraging of oneself. So I, I give you the kind of the background of this is uh, cognitive behavior therapy but I want to actually take you through examples because it gives you some ideas as to where you might get trapped in, um, in how you, you best serve and connect and, and love your loved one. So, so the family member might think to themselves, I have to be the strong one. I can't let him or her know how I really feel. If I fall apart, that will make it worse for him or her. Now, I understand that this comes out of a place of compassion. You don't want to, or you think you don't want to bring your extra emotional baggage to your loved one who is going through a cancer diagnosis because then it's just one extra stress on them. So I can see how this core belief gets started. Um, but the, the takeaway is that this actually doesn't work. It's just, it's, it's a functionally, this doesn't work for a whole bunch of reasons. But I, I like to kind of take, take you through why and what happens within the relationship. So if you put on the big, I have to be the strong one, got to put on the happy mask, the positive mask all the time, I can't let myself fall apart. What happens to the relationship? A, I think there's kind of isolation. The, the two partners get into kind of a silo and then they start putting on the happy mask for each other. So what your, your loved one with the cancer diagnosis will say was, you can't actually be open and vulnerable. And so you're not allowing them to be open and vulnerable, right? So you're setting a culture of distance within the relationship. And I mean, the other thing I'd say is, can, can you even fake this? And I'd say, no, your partner 
who has the cancer diagnosis sees right through you, right? They know how you're feeling. They've lived with you long enough to know that this is not the true you. You're, you're putting on the false mask. Is it exaggerated or irrational? So the, la the fourth question is really around, if you were a lawyer, how could you deconstruct this argument? Well, the last line is, if I fall apart, that will make it worse for him or her. That's what they call the fortune teller error, meaning um, I know exactly how that person responds if I do this particular thing, right? And so I know the emotional consequence of it. So, mm, well, if you know, you know you're, you're kind of limiting the capacity of that person to actually see a bigger picture. So fact is this doesn't work. And so what I would say is how do we reframe how do we talk to ourselves and kind of question that core belief? And I'm going to try to push you this whole presentation to actually be yourself and be authentic with your partner. So how we reframe this is the following. It's best to be honest with each other, with our feelings. It creates more intimacy, right? You're setting the culture for intimacy. And that culture and intimacy creates the support. If I fall apart, how do I know that will make him feel worse. In fact, consoling me make, may make her or him feel better, right? So now it's like, now the care is actually going in both directions. That person feels connected with you when you're open and vulnerable about those tough feelings. So it's like, then they support you. And it's like, then we're breaking down the silos, then we're actually connecting kind of an emotional level. So that's the first kind of takeaway is it isn't helpful to put on the happy mask. You're right. You don't want to be like breaking down, you know, melting into a puddle every minute of the day. That's not helpful either. So obviously there's, there's a bit of a middle ground here, but to try to just say, we could do this honey all the time. And, you know, you know, just put on the smiles, no matter what is not helpful from a kind of uh, relationship perspective, almost always. Okay. So <clears throat> context. <clears throat> and this is where you might be playing different roles. I'm trying, I'm trying to give you an overview. What is complete cancer care or integrative oncology? Well, I would say it starts with understanding the powers and in information. And the information is about the medical system. It's about all the elements of the medical system. It's about what you can do to empower yourself, body, mind, and spirit. It's like, it's like truly understanding what you can and cannot influence. And that's actually a really key point is um, sometimes we can't control things. We can't control other people's behaviors, can't necessarily control the medical system. So know what you can influence, what you can't influence is the understanding piece and let go of what you can't control. Advocating, we're actually going to talk about this a little bit in terms of the medical system, getting the best from the medical system. Uh, yeah, again, the person with a cancer diagnosis kind of gets to choose uh, these healthy activities, but I think Again, you can model this because I want you to be healthy. I want you to have the right degree of exercise. Diet, you'd have an influence. The sleep patterns have an influence. Practicing relaxation, modeling good behavior, taking care of yourself because it can be a very long slog, right? So you model this. Healing at the level of mind. We're starting to work on some of those core beliefs there. Nurturing a spiritual perspective is what I um, believe is like the complete complete package in some sense. Information, obviously you or your partner are going to decide how you want to figure this out. Somebody's got to be an expert understanding the language of the medical system. It will help with making better decisions. And there are non-medical ways to improve your health and outcome. Okay. So that's getting understanding big picture. And then lastly, it keeps on changing. There's no one best way, different strategies for different personalities at different times. I'd say as, as a overview though, is you want to use your scientific, rational, logical mind in some sense, but there's also this kind of sense of wisdom or intuition, something within you wants yourself to heal. And it's also is there to try to make the best decisions for your loved one too right? Things change, you know, especially end of treatment. There's lots of transitions uh, there. So, okay. The medical system, big picture. 
what's what really is the the biggest perspective is that your oncologist or your loved one's oncologist i'm going to use it interchangeably your oncologist provides the individualized care they're the ones who understand the situation they've studied all these years they're tapping into the international trials to bring out the nuances of that person's particular situation and so they're the ones who are kind of prescribing and they're the ones that can actually give the best advice around it and so you need to maximize that interaction and prepare for those conversations understand what's happening if your loved one with the cancer diagnosis doesn't want to do it then you should do that obviously you can take it too far right if if you're going crazy on uh information gathering internet searches late at night and especially if your loved one with a cancer diagnosis doesn't want all this extra suggestion and the 25 different types of alternative medication it's like again they need to be the one who's dictating how much information you're gathering and how you're gathering that if you're getting conflicting information between what your doctor is saying or different healthcare professionals are saying that's again where you want to get back to your oncologist or the nurse or part of the system to clarify. So that kind of sense of unease or disparity information, you want to keep going back. Ultimately, you want that feeling, your loved one wants that feeling that you're doing the right thing for you. You're getting the best care for you. You, you want to get to that stage. And sometimes like there's not many good options here, but we're getting the best for the situation. Again, just the trust that there's nothing else you should be going for. We get the information in lots of different ways. Um, so Wellspring, you know, has, you know, taps into these information services as well, but the not-for-profits in your type of cancer. So, you know, pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cancer Canada has, you know, specific information. I like the Canadian Cancer Society. You can talk to an information specialist who will tailor the information to your level, send you either paper package or email package. You can phone there talk to your peer support. There's lots of, lots of good not-for-profit organizations uh, there. Okay, so then actually thinking about the medical system itself, uh, big picture, you're preparing, you're advocating for yourself when if there's questions or concerns. And then the other thing you probably don't realize as much is there's a lot of extra service within the medical system and so if you're running into a particular problem and Benita was actually mentioning some of these things like brain fog and, you know, fatigue issues and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there are experts there. Nutrition is an expert exercise. Like there's a lot of expertise there that you can tap into if you're running into a particular problem. And lastly, I talk about when and when and how to get a second opinion if, if that's actually needed. Okay. So before the visit, you're thinking about that next appointment you need to have the story clear, right? Bring in that current set of medications, allergies, make sure your questions are written down. <clears throat> so your role might be the, the kind of the scribe in this circumstance to have the, 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 the questions ready to go. I'll give you the, the other kind of quick advice around this. Typically what happens within the interaction is the physician will have kind of read around your chart, try to understand as best they can. They'll come in and talk to you for X number of minutes, and then they'll examine you to make sure that there's nothing there. And then they'll summarize what's happened and then make a recommendation as to what's the next step. Usually they're going to answer probably 80% of your questions uh, in the, the last part of um, the encounter. So typically what you do then is wait until they've said their spiel and then, you know, ask, I have a couple of questions and quickly scan through your questions to make sure that all the questions have been answered. You're the most important person in the room, right? You're the someone who should accompany, accompany you, right? So beforehand, you're making your strategy. You could even use like an audio um, recorder, right? And especially because in the first consultation, typically most people are retaining about 20% of what's saying, what is said. So you know, you might be the scribe, uh, the loved one with a cancer diagnosis might be just interacting directly. <clears throat> I also believe that you should keep a file of your test records. So it's almost like a second set of, uh, from the medical system. And the reason being is sometimes the physicians have difficulty finding those records through the, um, 
the electronic medical record. So you have that information on hand. The, the nurses love it. The physicians love it. They, they know it's, it's legit. Okay, so then when we're actually interacting with a doc, and again, this is more advice for the person with the cancer diagnosis, but it really, if the physicians don't know what's happening, it's hard for them to, um, uh, you know, to make those recommendations. Sometimes the doctors talk in baffle gab and you or the, your loved one with a cancer diagnosis can feel overwhelmed. And you might have to say, just, just a sec, I'm not sure I understand. Can you please repeat in simpler language, right? So being just, you know, you can jump in with that question if it's obvious that this is just getting out of hand there. I told you about the, the summary of this. And then the last thing is like trying to figure out what your responsibility is going out the door, what to expect. What side effects with that treatment? How bad are the side effects going to get? What do, when do I need to act? Who can I call at 3 a.m.? Like, know your job. And some, sometimes the clinicians are good at making sure it's clear, but you need to make sure you're going out the door knowing what to expect, possible side effects, et cetera. Keep a journal. If need be, I mean, sometimes uh, if it's more complicated and it's hard to... Uh, share that information with a loved one or the whole family, then you might ask for a family conference, have the, the multiple person Zoom call, you know, especially if it's, when it's first diagnosis or more complicated. Or if you're in with your physician in person, then put the, the cell phone out and put on speaker function and, and invite people to, to listen in. So be smart about that. Remember, the medical system is there to serve the person with a cancer diagnosis, right? It's, it's really keep that in mind that this is, that, that's why we're set up. Uh, and don't let the kind of sense of, you know, busyness or anything else dissuade you from remembering that you're there to advocate and making sure you're getting the best care possible. Um, sometimes if there's a kind of breakdown in communication, you as the, the loved one, family member might be able to ask the questions, do the talking, get the information. It's possible that you could be playing that role as well. Obviously I'm telling you, keep on calling. Squeaky wheel gets the, re the grease. If, if you're having problems understanding, you want to get that phone call, keep, keep on asking. Uh, you're more likely to get that, that treatment. You're entitled to a second opinion. It's typically not necessary because the physicians in Canada are tapping into the international trials. There are essentially provincial and national guidelines that usually say in this particular circumstance, this is how we treat the situation. So typically that's kind of straightforward. But if you feel like you can't communicate with your physician or you don't trust your physician, then you do want to get a second opinion then. And how you do that is to go to your family doctor and say, please make another referral or talk to the nurse of that clinician and say, I really want a second opinion. Again, you're the most important person. Uh, you know, it happens that sometimes the, the clinicians and the patient don't get along. And, you know, the second physician is not going to treat you poorly because of, because of that. They, the oncologists are very, very good at making sure you're getting the best care, the second oncologist. Okay, so let's do another... Um, another reframing. So you might think back and, um, you know, recognize maybe your loved one, you know, had these symptoms. They went into the merge, got sent away, you know, went to see the family doctor, got sent away, finally went to the merge, you know, scan, you know, three weeks later. So there was, you know, from a legitic, legitimate perspective, from symptoms to when they actually got a diagnosis, there was a delay. That's the truth. I'm not saying that, you know, we, we shouldn't be frustrated, but if we exaggerate, um, you know, and start to judge what's actually happened there in a very, very negative way, it can actually cause us more distress that's not helpful. So I'm going to take you through this next one. So yes, there's been a delay. I'm not trying to, personally, I'm not trying to defend the medical system. I'm just saying, if you exaggerate this, you could make yourself feel worse and it doesn't, doesn't bring healing into the situation. So if that's happened and then you say to yourself, the medical system sucks, right? So it's like a very negative perception. How do you feel? Like, is that making you feel better? Is that making your loved one with the cancer diagnosis feel better? I would say it, it, it engenders a kind of an anger and a stress reaction, depletes our energy. 
it's not totally helpful. Yes, you have to understand the medical system is a human in institution, but you know, just to see it's 100% sucky 100% of the time is not helpful. That's the exaggeration. What you're saying is there's nothing good about it, right? When you're kind of so focused on the negative. Yes, we need to be aware of it. We need to do all the things I'm talking about in terms of advocating for yourself, but to think this wholly isn't helpful. So how do we work with this? The medical system sucks. So acknowledge it is frustrating. It's saddening that this has happened. And I should, I should say, and I can learn from how to get the best care from what they have to offer, right? I can get stronger from this and I can really make a difference in, by empowering my body or, or helping my loved one empower their body, right? So it's like, okay, this is tough. I understand that. I have to be on my toes within the medical system, but I can re actually re really make a difference. And there are good people in the medical system. And we live in Canada and we get you know, very good care, relatively speaking, internationally. Okay, so there's the next one of dealing with the kind of pure negativity. The point is, one of the points are that there is a lot of, there's a lot to the medical system, right? There's a lot of experts. And I would say almost everybody should chat with a nutritionist, um, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of other people. You know, if you're having swelling of your arm lymphedema, you know, there's a specialist for that, et cetera, et cetera. Typically, the social worker can help coordinate some of the kind of financial stuff, but ask your doctor or nurse, um, you know, I'm having this severe fatigue. Is there somebody I can chat with? Um, I'm having this very bad pain. Is there a pain specialist I can chat with? So it, sometimes it just primes the physician to remember about those other family members. I want to talk about complementary and alternative medicine. This is my perspective. I'm scientifically based. I've been very interested in this topic for 25 plus years. Science says, well, actually I'll get the summary in a second, but what I would say is, um, again, if you're interested, then I would use both your science logical mind and also how, how your, your gut points you to tell your doctor what you're taking, especially if it's something uh, oral or uh, by IV, because there can be interactions between that and the medical system. And please don't forgo the proven treatments because the truth is at present from a scientific perspective, there's no convincing evidence that any complementary health approach is effective in curing cancer that wouldn't happen otherwise. Not to say that's not possible, um, but you know, on average, um, it's extremely rare to have a complementary health do the cure. There are many that actually make people feel a whole bunch better though, and get people through their treatments more easily. And, you know, you can tap into a lot of those things, help with pain and energy and psychological well-being and so on. So I'm not dissuading you from that side. Just don't forego the, the proven treatment. Okay. We're going to just have a little stretch here. Just, we're, I know half an hour in, look away from the screen up towards the sky, stretching up. Oh yeah, and shake those legs, shake out the energy. Okay, come on down, come on back. Okay, let's do another one. And this is, I mean, I, I'm, my heart's with you, right? COVID has created delays in terms of you no know, staging tests, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really, it's a very, very hard thing to do is to be waiting, waiting for the tests, waiting for the results. Um, Again, if you're exaggerating to this extent, waiting for these results is killing us, right? It's like, ah, this is too much. How do you feel when you talk to yourself that way? Like, again, is that kind of sense of frustration or despair maybe? Um, it can either depress you or agitate you. It's not helpful. How is it exaggerating? The point is we don't know. Uh, yes, we don't want to wait too long, um, but really it like killing us right now. So how do we reframe? I can learn to have patience and stay in the moment, right? So you want to enjoy your life and your connection with your loved one now and not project a negative future because it's just causing you distress and learning to work with those stresses will make you a better person, allow you to be more loving and so on. So you want to continue to work on that side 
of you know whatever is pushing your button and really causing you extreme ag uh, agitation. Yes, advocate, call, make those, you know, do what you can do, but ultimately at some points we can't control these things. We want to be able to let go of what we can't control. Okay, so there's another reframe for you with kindness, right? Because it is tough. It is stressful. I'm not, I'm not minimizing the stress of that weight. I'm just saying, can we do better? Can we be more loving? Can we be more centered? Okay, so from a body perspective now, so you can't force your loved one to do these things, but you can do them for yourself and you can help facilitate this. And you have that conversation about these things. So, so for instance, if we know that exercise decreases the risk of your particular type of cancer, then you want to do that after diagnosis. And the way I think about it is if there are cancer cells in the body, we don't want ongoing damage to those cells. We don't want to go faster cells. So exercise, exercise, exercise. And sometimes it's even just the three minute walk, getting out the door is actually boost the mood on the spot, right? And also focus, something you can do together, for instance, and there's strong doubt. I, can, I really can um, riff for a long time around how exercises changes the physiology. There's some science to show why it particularly improves survival in different types of cancer. But you will feel better. Your loved one hopefully will feel better if they decide to do this as well. Better immune function, inflammation. Um, so really do what it takes. Be creative. Make it fun. How do you do it? Yes, yes, yes. Make it fun. Do the thing that's fun. Make it social. Do it with a, a loved one or a friend. Create that routine. But ultimately, it is a, a some sense about doing the work, either, either for yourself or if your loved one wants to do it. You just need to do it. it there's a persistence high after 20 minutes that, that releases the hormones that will make you feel better and drives the pro-social behavior. You're actually a happier version of yourself uh, when you exercise. I want to warn, and it's, it's hard for some people because if, if you're you know, really sick and in the midst of treatment, you might be kind of wiped out. Uh, but many of you will live for years and decades. And I want to talk to you about something called sedentarism. And essentially, it's um, laying or sitting uh, for too long. Um, and so we have all these uh, different activities in our lives, and it's just not healthy to sit for too long. So every hour up for five minutes. One hour means five minutes on your feet every hour. So think about it yourself there. Too much sitting. Um, yeah, five minutes is what I said. And here's the data essentially, um, that again, if it's a risk of developing cancer, then you want to avoid it after you get a cancer diagnosis. So, um, all cause mortality, it changes the fats and sugars in your bloodstream, which can actually prime the cancer cells to grow. So that's essentially an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, like heart attack and stroke diabetes, and there are the cancer risks. Again, large studies showing increased risk if you're sitting too much, sitting for that three or four hours in a row, days on end, right? So we want to avoid that once we get a, a, a cancer diagnosis. Um, takes, look at that, it's, um, it's an hour of, of sitting straight has a greater impact on your longevity than smoking a cigarette, for instance. How do you do it? Um, a stand-up desk, I think, is the, is the smart move there. But look for every opportunity, especially, for instance, transitioning between one sedentary activity and another sedentary activity. So if you're you know, doing your emails and then you're going to go watch Netflix with your partner or spouse, or whatever. You want to have a transition where you're up on your feet, and maybe washing the dishes or cleaning up the room or going for a little quick walk outside or something so that you're not just sitting, 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 sitting all the way around. One of the rituals I like is I, I automatically, if I'm on the phone, I try to stand up immediately. So that way I'm, I, I don't need to be sitting down while I'm talking on the phone. So I get up more often than the day. So let's get up again, guys. Just even four or five seconds do the kind of happy dance on the spot. Stretch it out. <clears throat> Just look for those opportunities. Yes, I didn't do that for five minutes, but at least we're getting some movement uh, there as well.
Okay. This is a tricky one. They say you're supposed to stay positive, but I feel angry, helpless, filled with despair. I can't go on like this. Right. So this is somebody who thinks that being positive, like boosts the immune function and allows for the spontaneous remission, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem with this is if it's exaggerated, then it, it doesn't work. It's just not realistic. First of all, I feel uh, awful, angry, helpless, and filled with despair. Um, if feelings are, are normal. Like it's okay to have whatever feelings are happening. What we're trying to do is go after the core belief, which is I have to stay positive all the time. So if you talk to yourself that way and you're not feeling positive, this kind of um, conflict in your emotional state, um, then you know, this is kind of tension, a stress reaction. Stress reaction causes the body to not function as well. I'm going to suggest that it's not helpful to try to be super positive all the time. Because who is ever super, who, who feels super positive all the time? It's a, it's a rare individual, right? Mostly we have good days, bad days, good moments, bad moments. We're like, we're fluctuating up and down. That's a normal rhythm or cycle. And to try to stay positive, happy, you know, happy mask is just not natural. And your loved one, you know, can see through it. It's just not a, it's not a natural thing. And yes, we don't want to be Debbie Downer all the time, but at the same time, it just doesn't work. And so how do we talk to ourselves? It's natural to have strong and negative feelings. I'm learning to comfort myself and ask for reassurance from others, right? So when you're feeling lousy, instead of just trying to put on the happy mask, you reach out. You say, look, I can work with this. I can allow those emotions to come through me. It's a natural. I mean, you can also be just grieving, right? Grieving the loss of, of what's happening in your loved one's life. It's okay to feel grief. That's, it's normal and natural. So you allow those things to naturally percolate through and don't try to stop yourself from feeling what you're feeling. Okay, I'm going to do a, uh, a quicker version of how you as the loved one, family member, can help facilitate good nutrition, right? Look for those opportunities. Talk to the expert in the cancer center. If there are particular problems, right, in terms of diet and weight and nausea, vomit, diarrhea, all that stuff, then again, you need, to you need that kind of expertise to kind of guide you around these issues change the soup, right? So the, the soup around the cells called epigenetics is driving the cell growth. Inflammation is the kind of irritable um, chemicals in the body causes damage to the cells. And then the cells are the cancer cells, increases cell turnover. It's like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, everything, inflammation, less inflammation. So we want an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, which will obviously happens through diet. Exercise is obviously very um, anti-inflammatory. It kind of burns those off. Um, meditation, relaxation, stress reduction, sleep. All these things that I'm talking about helps the body release or unleash its um, uh, healing capacity, healing potential, right? Be kind to your gut. The 100 trillion bacteria in your gut are doing so much for you. And when we have those awful diets, you know, just like red meats and, you know, processed foods, you're just like killing off that good bacteria. And it ends up irritating the lining of the gut, causing like varying degrees of leaky gut syndrome that releases those chemicals into the body. So really have to be very, very kind to your gut. Feed your bacteria, whether it's with um, probiotics, the fiber prebiotics is the actual bacteria itself. Um, you know, you don't want to use the same types of bacteria. You have to keep switching it out. And I think a, a healthy diet by itself with the fruits and vegetables is the way to get the, to feed that bacteria there. How does diet help? Well, the antioxidants, the fruits and vegetables mop up the damaging chemicals. And the other one is if you have high sugar levels, you drink that pop, the sh blood sugar goes up, your insulin gets secreted into the bloodstream to bring it down. But insulin also um, has associated molecules of insulin uh, related growth factor, and that actually primes cell growth. So you don't want the 
the sugar spikes and drops. You want a kind of a nice smooth um, glucose in your blood. So you're changing the soup, empowering yourself, improving your immune function. So that's why diet is really important. And you know the role that you can play in terms of trying to get those healthy foods into the house and like hide the cookies, put the cookies in the cupboard so that you know the you're not tempted to eat the crappy stuff. Dietary vice micronutrients from multiple food groups at each, at each meal, even half the plate should be fruits and ve vegetables, reducing the red and processed meat or eliminating, I guess, healthy fluids, healthy fats, less of the sugary fatty stuff, the healthy fats kind of allow the brain and nervous system, lots of different things to heal themselves. You're adding the healthy foods. Vitamin D is the only supplement that you really need unless your physician is saying something else, not other supplements. And then this kind of sense of enjoying connecting over food. Um, yeah, so these are the, this is the big four food group. There's the vitamin D, making sure you're getting enough uh, calcium in your diet. Um, get the advice there. Here's my vitamin D habit. I just want to say that you know, as I reach for my toothbrush in the morning, I'm reaching for my vitamin D and B12 because I'm essentially eating a vegetarian diet. So that's happening as a, as a habit each day. And I do a little celebration. Whoo, got my vitamin D. Shopping, something else you can have an influence on, right? So you're planning ahead. Don't shop when you're hungry or tired, when you don't have the willpower to make the best decisions possible. Say, so read the labels, right? They're actually going to, consolidate the sugars. You're going to see a lot more sugar in them on the, the ingredients list. So you want to stay away from the sugars. Just don't buy the unhealthy stuff. If it doesn't get to your house, it's hard to eat. So there's uh, the little label from the oatmeal uh, that we eat in the morning. You can see that essentially it's, it's, it's healthy vegetable-based products. There's no real chemicals uh, there. And then there's this issue of efficiency, right? So by the Sunday afternoon, you know, the prepping and having those very convenient fruits and vegetables, it makes for very quick uh, snacks and food preparations. The other thing I would say is that frozen veggies are also a great option. You hardly lose any of the kind of um, really healthy elements of those veggies by flash freezing them uh, type thing. And so frozen blueberries, for instance, um, all healthy stuff that allows, again, it's a convenience factor. Boom, that's, that goes into a stir fry right there and you're 10 minutes out from, you know, very healthy uh, dish. Frozen foods, you have your list there. There's more and more fantastic products, uh, convenient products in the market, including veggie burgers. Uh, so tips to make this work, you know, so you're not, I, 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 well, you can if you're in the kind of crisis mode of kind of doing like it all at once. But I think, because I think about this in the long term, I want the slower transition. You're testing out the foods that you love and enjoy, and it's, it's slowly uh, integrating more and more healthy meals and dishes into your life. So it's the slow transition into what's going to work, and you slowly increase the number of like purely plant-based uh, meals that you have uh, each week, and you just stay away from the unhealthy stuff. Okay. I also just want to, you know, I, I usually um, don't talk about maintaining a reasonable weight because if you, if you exercise, if you uh, have a reasonable diet, then your body typically will be at a healthy uh, medium. And it's not actually the number on the scale. It's actually how you feel from an energetic perspective. I think that's, that's the more important thing in terms of long-term health. Get your energy up through these healthy habits. Okay, this is also common. I feel so guilty to be worried about myself, right? People think about, well, what's going to happen if my loved one with the cancer diagnosis dies? How am I going to live my life? What's going to happen? And then you recognize you're thinking like this, like you, you know, might be thinking like, I'm wishing my family member dead. But the point is that this is normal. This is like, this is what we humans do. We think about the future. We think about possibilities. And so it's normal and natural to feel guilty, although kind of unjustified to, you know, feel so guilty. Um, you know, I'm thinking about how I'm going to take care of myself. And yet here it is, my 
And my loved one with the cancer diagnosis is suffering so much right now. I, you know, this shouldn't happen. Well, welcome to being human. This is what we humans do. And yes, we don't want to, you know, miss out an opportunity of really loving and connecting now and having the best possible life now. But in some sense, I'm saying it's okay. You're going to have these natural, normal, you know, planning for the future. You don't have to feel so guilty. So feeling guilty makes you feel worse. Is it helpful? Is it really helpful to feel that guilty? Yes, you want to make sure you're focusing on what you can do now, but is that may not be that helpful. Um, and then the reframe, feeling guilty doesn't help anyone. I worry and suffer too, right? It's not, it's not like it's just like your loved one with the cancer diagnosis is going through a tough time. You're going through a tough time too, right? And so you'd be able to be able to accept that and not be hard on yourself. Um, you know, so be able to be real about what you're going through is really helping in the relationship. It keeps it a genuine relationship. So, okay. Just a little bit around sleep because you might be able to influence your loved one. If there's a real problem, then you want to be able to get some extra help around uh, the sleep and sleep expert. Sleep habits, generally speaking, if you can decrease your stress levels and your anxiety levels throughout the day, then you'll sleep better at night. And so all these other health promoting activities like exercise, meditation, and the reframing that we've been working on so far decreases stress, you're more likely to have a better night's sleep. There's this idea of healthy sleep practices uh, that allow your brain to train itself to, uh, to actually get to bed better. So you're, you're, you're kind of conditioning yourself each other, but you're creating this, the uh, conditions in which a good night's sleep can happen. So that's what's your responsibility there. The number one advice around this is to create a routine so that you and your loved one, if that if they're if they're sleeping with you, you guys are going to the bed at the same time. You're trying to get up at the same time. It's like getting yourself into that cycle. And sometimes that's really hard to do in the midst of treatment. And I'm I'm recognizing that. But for the most part, I'm thinking about a longer term idea. Setting a, a lights out alarm, you know, maybe 15 minutes before you actually want to turn out the light. Write down your worries or plans so you can set that aside. You know it's there. It's going to be there in in the morning. So then you can just concentrate on sleeping, get up at the same time, uh, avoid the screen time, avoid exercising or eating a heavy meal, you know, beforehand caffeine, for instance, a uh, half-life of five to eight hours means that a quarter of a cup is there after two half-lives, 10 hours later, you still have a quarter of uh, caffeine in your system. So drink your coffee in the morning, avoid alcohol, although it can sedate you, it doesn't allow you to have a recovered sleep. Avoid the sleeping pills for the same reason. You want to mimic uh, the sun. So dimming of the lights as the as night goes on. You can use the blue blocking glasses if you're having to write emails at night. Uh, eye shades, especially this time of year, summertime, the sun could be waking you up. And then ultimately trying to get yourself into that cycle of looking outside, getting the natural light for the first 30 minutes of the day because 12 hours later, you'll get the drive to have uh, go back to sleep again. So a whole bunch of situations. I know this may not pertain to you, but by taking care of yourself, you'll be in a better position to, to function better and to have more energy for your loved one. Ideal bed conditions. You know, the cool bedroom also allows your core body to drop a couple degrees Celsius is what you actually need to do to fall asleep or better fall asleep. If you run into insomnia, the science shows that um, if you're obviously awake beyond about 20, 25 minutes, you actually go to a different room. So then you're training your brain to fall asleep. So when you're tired, then you return to your bedroom feeling sleepy and your brain says, okay, sleepiness, this bedroom, I, now is the time to sleep. You practice a relaxation technique, you visualize a peaceful activity. There's something, you know, for people who have ongoing insomnia, there's some really good scientifically proven treatment that's harsh, but works. And at least it's the best, it's the best uh, system, uh, CBT, it's ins for insomnia. <clears throat> Melatonin is good if you're flying in time zones, but otherwise do not take it chronically. There are long-term side effects. I don't know exactly what that is, but um, you don't want to be on uh, melatonin every night. 
I do believe in naps. You don't want to have that replacing your sleep. It's like giving yourself a little bit of REM in the afternoon. So you do it earlier in the day so that you can fall asleep at night. I do, I do uh, believe in napping. Um, and lastly, it's this kind of sense of kindness to yourself. I care about myself. I want to be strong. I want to be healthy so I can be there for my loved one. Right. So it's that kind of sense of calm and not judgment and not frustration. It's a peaceful process. <clears throat> Last couple of uh, suggestions practicing some type of relaxation technique. Right. So you, like we did uh, at the start there, you're training your nervous system to be able to tap into a relaxation response that has a whole bunch of benefits. You're your happier self. You're better able to access your wise and compassionate part of your brain, which is your frontal lobe, have more energy, clearer thinking, better immune function. So practicing relaxation technique is, is, is very important. You tap into that relaxation. And there's just, I mean, there's lots of different ways to do this, but it's the idea that it's, it's not like just taking a bath or going for a walk. It's like being able to watch the chattering mind and bring yourself back into the relaxed state. So you're, it's the muscle coming back to the sense of groundedness. So whether they do that through meditation, this guy might be doing like a visualization, getting up on their feet, qigong, tai chi. Again, it's the idea of coming back home to um, your centered, positive, peaceful state. And again, lots of benefits on that side. I'm showing you a biofeedback monitor using heart rate variability. So a clip on the ear into a smartphone allows yourself to train the, the relaxation side of your nervous system. You get better and better and better at doing that. And then that sends the signal from your heart to your brain and to feel more calm. Okay. A couple of these, I hate this cancer. It's ruining, ruining our lives and all the things we do together. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the, the inherent suffering that happens when, you know, there's a shock and, un, you know, unexpected diagnosis, things have changed, but the exaggerated language can detract you from something that's very precious and sacred, right? So if we talk to ourselves that way, we lose out. I hate this cancer. Again, this frustration, stress reaction, it's not really helpful to be continuing to talk to yourself what, that way. How is it exaggerated? It's ruining our lives and all the things we do together. So there's no things you now do together that there's connection. Is that how, what, what you're stating in that? So the kind of exaggeration. So what we're trying to do is peel off the extra 5% that's unnecessary in this. So the reframe Anger, rage, hate only makes me feel worse and adds stress to the whole family. With acceptance, I can enjoy the time that we do have. We may not be as active, but time together is very precious, right? So focus on what you can control, right? And just make the best of it. I'm, it's easy for me to say, I recognize it's really, really difficult to go through, um, but the more you can stay there to say, well, how can I connect? How can I love in the midst of the great difficulty? Stretch. Last thing, um, working with stress, right? Stress is normal. You're going to feel flustered and angry. Um, practicing a relaxation technique can um, reset your stressometer at a lower level so you're functioning better. It's important to identify when you're overwhelmed. And then you can just practice the four breath technique of you know, pressing the pause button, button, slow, smooth out breath, using your mindfulness and then talking to yourself in a way that's positive and encouraging. Using, I mean, the kind of third column of these reframed, it's like, it's that's the voice, that's the wise and compassionate voice that's tapped into wisdom and, you know, proactivity. So you want to be able to access that. You access that by settling yourself down and remembering what's most important. Look for ways to reach out, connect, and so on. So bottom line, your loved one and you both 
it's normal to have these emotions. It's like, this is what we humans go through when there's a cancer diagnosis. That's the expectation. We don't have to fight against expectation. We don't have to, you know, those, those emotions by themselves aren't going to hurt you. Um, they can be exaggerated and then they can kind of fluctuate and come out kind of unexpectedly. That's normal and not to fight against that. So then when that happens, there's no one right way. I can't give you a particular technique around this. I think it's important to share those, what's happening with your loved one. It may not be the person with the cancer diagnosis, but at least one wise person in your life you want to talk to, right? Emotions will change. Be kind to yourself. Like this is, this is tough stuff. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be, do your best. Keep on coming back home again. If your loved one is breaking down, if they're like totally in tears and melting, you know, on the floor in some emotion, just stay there. You do not have to correct this. You do not have to make this go away. That's not going to last forever. They're not going to cry forever. So you stay with your own uncomfortable feelings. Ah, this is hard, right? And you listen and you acknowledge and you empathize. And you stay there and you promise what you can deliver. Like we're going, we're going through this together, hon. We're going to, we're going to figure this out and I'm with you no matter what. Right. So you promise that and you don't try to suppress it. Allow them to be themselves, allow them to have their emotions. Obviously if it gets out of control, um, you know, if they're totally depressed or you're totally depressed and you can't concentrate you're withdrawing from life you know this is like like um, what i'm describing here is a major depression right can't decide in treatment can't sleep anxiety so sometimes we do need to actually see an expert sometimes we do need to get onto medication to get us through the um these tough times how do you get that help well you can talk to your oncologist or nurse like you know we're really struggling struggling psychologically they can make that referral a family doctor can make that referral oftentimes the cancer centers have a psychosocial oncology uh, program or a counselor at the center can can meet with you but find an expert go to a support group um you know there are ways to when you're really hurting you can can tap into this okay finishing off now i want you to think about how like i've, I've given you kind of a bit of an overview it's not the whole whole pie a bit of an overview of the various roles that you can play because life has to go on and you still have to get medical care with a loved one who has a cancer diagnosis. And so this is kind of a negotiated process. One of the things you can do is to be the sharer of medical updates, right? So you go to the appointments with your loved one and then the rest of the family wants to find out what's happening. Well, your loved one may not be, wanna spend the psychological energy to kind of tell every single relative what's happening. So you might be the bearer of that news, the sharer of the medical updates. So that's one opportunity. If your loved one doesn't wanna be the one in charge of um, you know, the medical appointments, the medical, um, you know, all that kind of interaction, then somebody needs to take that role, right? Somebody needs to make sure you're on board, have, the, have that information together. I'd also say, um, you know, someone needs to be the med medical expert to really know the type of cancer, stage of cancer, treatment options, side effects, one of the medications, like somebody needs to know that information. Someone needs to be the expert. And again, your loved one may not want to do it and you might have to jump in. Again, a negotiated um, uh, perspective. I, I think it's, it's important to have at least one confidant your loved one may not choose you. Your loved one may choose, um, you know, a son or a daughter. You know, it's it's okay. You don't have to be the star. Um, but I think it's important for you to have a confidant. It's important for your loved one to have a confidant. The two of you can be confidants for each other, which I really think is the best thing. But in some sense, somebody uh, has to be able to have that wise and open ear for you. And yes, then life goes on as well, right? So the household stuff, the odd job stuff, you know, this, you know, your loved one with a cancer diagnosis may not be able to do this. So it's like ongoing, how can we make this work? And it doesn't stop when treatment stops, right? It's, you know, the person with a cancer diagnosis can have that kind of ongoing psychological transformation over time. 
um, and um, you have, you know, be patient and you know, continue to talk about um, you know, how you can fulfill those roles, even having a monthly meeting and say, okay, first Sunday of the night, night uh, of the month at 6 PM, we're going to talk about like, how are things going? Are these roles covered? Are you feeling good about this? Do we need to change anything? Right. So it's this kind of open, honest, oh, I'm getting frustrated with this, or, you know, I'm really worried or whatever's happened, at least you can have, um, that open conversation. So that's really what I'm trying to, um, recommend for you is that, you keep the communication open and authentic. Tell the truth. Tell your truth and listen and care and try not to you know, do anything different for them. Okay, uh, here's a great opportunity. If you're interested, we are selling our book, The Healing Circle. It's the complete teachings from a weekend retreat. So we talk about, in fact, the whole quarter of that is around reframing. Uh, and then there's also amazing stories of people who've who've had real healing in their lives. Uh, so that's, you can order through our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Um, and really happy to answer questions.